Counter illumination, that's what we see uh, when the fish um, uh, is up near the surface of the water. And we saw this with this uh, uh, Hawaiian bobtailed squid when we talked about that uh, a few weeks ago. The Hawaiian bobtailed squid illuminates its ventral surface as well. So it's camouflage against the, uh, against the dawn sky that it doesn't actually uh, uh, cast a silhouette or a shadow. So there are some fish that do the same kind of thing. And some of them will, will do it for exactly the same purpose, to camouflage themselves against uh, predators if they're small fish. But there are some fairly aggressive fish, such as one uh, particular kind of fish, which is called the cookie cutter shark. And sharks are unusual anyway in terms of being bioluminescent uh, organisms because there are very few bioluminescent sharks. I only know of three. There may be more, but there are many more kinds of uh, uh, osteichthyes, that is bony fish, that are bioluminescent than there are bioluminescent sharks. Um, so um, basically, uh, what, the, what this cookie cutter shark does is it's got photophores all over its ventral surface. Uh, except in one area, and I'd say it's not a real big shark, it's perhaps uh, maybe a foot or so in, uh, in length, and up near uh, one part of its, uh, near its head, let's say this is the head up here, uh, there is a kind of a, a stripe here, a horizontal stripe, where there are no photophores. So when this shark is going like this in the water, it looks like a, uh, a little fish is swimming like that in the water not a foot long fish, but maybe a, foot, a fish that's maybe an inch or so in length, and it's going up and down. Now tuna swim in these waters, and tuna like these little tiny fish, <clears throat> and which is what this shark is trying to simulate, these small fish. So the tuna swims up, tuna comes up thinking it's going to get a meal, and the cookie cutter comes down very, very rapidly. The tuna is actually a lot bigger than the, than the cookie cutter in most instances. But the cookie cutter comes down and slams into the side of the uh, tuna's body with these very, very sharp jaws, very powerful jaws, and it gouges out a, um, a chunk of meat about the size of a golf ball from the size of the tuna. And it doesn't usually kill the tuna. The tuna usually recovers from the wound unless it gets very badly infected or if it's a, maybe a very small tuna. But a, an adult-sized tuna would not die from that wound and uh, the wound would just heal over again. So the uh, cookie cutters can actually get quite a, a few me uh, meals from a school of tuna, and they're not actually decimating the, uh, the school either when they do that. So it's an interesting mechanism uh, for getting food. And this fish is called uh, Cryptosaurus cusii. Common name is the triple wart sea devil, and uh, it's an angler fish. So what angler fish uh, do is they uh, actually have a structure. Uh, it's usually a modified dorsal fin, and uh, the structure comes, uh, in this particular case, is coming out of the, uh, uh, well, I'm going to show you the picture rather than my trying to show it on me. Let me just hold this picture up here so you can see this. All right, so here's the fish, and this is what I want to call your attention to, this lure. So here's your, here's your dorsal fin, and you notice it comes up here, and at the very tip of it is uh, what looks like a little streamer and a little bulb. And that little bulb actually is one of these bioluminescent uh, organisms, uh, bi bioluminescent uh, structures, rather, organs. And it's a, a bacterial filled. So uh, what the uh, anglerfish does is it's able to move this lure near its mouth. And when an unsuspecting fish uh, sees the lure, it's going to come down uh, too close to the angler's mouth and the angler is just sitting there on the bottom of the, uh, of the ocean waiting to eat. Um, this is a female angler, but there's something very interesting that I want to show you. And uh, I wanted to tell you something also, also about fish, which is that <clears throat> uh, you have an interesting uh, kind of sexual dimorphism in fish. The female is generally a lot larger than the male. She may be three or four times the size of her mate. Uh, this is the most extreme case of sexual dimorphic uh, size difference that I've ever seen though. So here's your female, and I don't know if you can see this little thing right here. It's a little structure right here that seems to be hanging off of her body. That's the male fish. The male fish in this diagram 
It says it's a parasitic male. All right, what this is actually is a, uh, um, the male has actually only exists for one purpose. The purpose of the male is to actually uh, fertilize the female. He has a very short lifespan. Uh, wh uh, what he does is he actually bites her right here. His mouth then fuses into her flesh. His circulatory system uh, becomes part of her circulatory system. Um, and he basically becomes catabolized. That is, all of his internal organs start to uh, actually uh, uh, disappear. And what we actually see is that uh, basically um, that as his, as his body begins to catabolize, the um, sperm from his body are actually transferred directly into her, um, into her uh, body and fertilize her eggs. And that actually um, uh, is, uh, completes uh, the life cycle of that fish. So that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, observation uh, for an unusual type of fish. Now there's another fish here that I want to uh, call to your attention. And this fish is referred to as uh, the viper fish. And the viper fish is a fish that is called uh, Choliatus uh, macuni. It has a hinged skull uh, and it uh, uh, allows it to rotate it up for swallowing very large prey. Let me show you a picture of this fish. This is an extremely uh, unusual looking fish and I'm going to point out some structures on this fish. Uh, the fish, first of all, this is the fish's eye right here. The structure that goes around here is the eye. Uh, you'll notice that there are also some white kinds of white things in this picture. Uh, here, and here, and here, and here, and then there's one very, very one large one that goes uh, along here. And basically what that is are teeth. And you'll notice that this one tooth is so large coming out of the animal's lower jaw going up to here, it almost pokes itself in the eye with its own tooth. It's incapable of closing its mouth fully because these teeth are so large. But what it can do is it can actually dislocate its jaw so it can open its mouth even larger and swallow prey that are actually larger than it has, than it is. And it has a, a very uh, uh, extendable uh, stomach. So it can actually, um, um, it looks almost like a snake. It's maybe a foot in length, but it actually uh, can swallow things that are quite a bit bigger than itself. And the entire, um, again, uh, the lateral uh, part of this fish is covered with these uh, photophores. So this is another bioluminescent uh, fish, deep sea. There's also fish that are called hatchet fish. Some of you that actually have home aquaria may be familiar with a freshwater hatchet fish. They are not bioluminescent. It's only the marine uh, hatchet fish that are bioluminescent. And these have, uh, again, laterally compressed bodies. So they're very, very thin, but on the side of the body, uh, we see these lights. And this is stern, uh, Sternoptics obscura. Uh, there's also a light uh, on the ventral surface of the fish, uh, that is the, uh, the, the belly. And uh, this uh, can, uh, provides illumination that blends in with the uh, uh, weak light from above. So it's actually a form of counter illumination. There's another fish uh, that I wanted to uh, talk to you about, uh, in addition to the uh, viper fish that I mentioned before, there's a fish called the dragonfish, or loose jaw, and this is Malacosteus aristomius. And uh, this fish is interesting because it's one of the few fish that is actually capable of producing two different colors of light. So it's got some photophores that have the typical blue-green uh, bioluminescent, but it has one particular light organ where it's actually producing red light. And I've mentioned before that red does not transmit uh, very well through the water. And most marine animals are basically blind to red light. They can't see anything. But this particular fish can see in the red and the uh, near infrared region of the spectrum. So basically it's able to actually uh, see whatever it is that um, whatever light is actually uh, uh, that it's producing. It can actually illuminate its prey, see its prey without actually being seen. So it makes it an easy way to get a meal. Uh, so that's another interesting uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, then there's another fish called the uh, bristlemouth, and these are uh, cyclophone 
that's the genus, and there's a variety of different species. And again, it's a fish that uses counter-illumination. Uh, but what's interesting about this fish is that uh, it's uh, it's producing its own light, but it's using um, it's using as its luciferin a chemical compound that we've seen before, which is solenterazine. And sol solenterazine is something that we see in selenerates, uh, bioluminescent selenerates. So these would be things like some of these bioluminescent jellyfish, uh, like aquaria, uh, which is uh, uh, the bioluminescent jellyfish from which is extracted um, uh, equarin, but you also have uh, it, it's similar. It's similar to that kind of a thing. But there are other, other, you know, particular things that actually make solenterazine. There, are, um, trying to remember now. There's uh, something called the. Uh, sometimes it's called the uh, sea firefly, I think. But it's actually an ostracod that makes is, that makes solenterazine as well. So anyway, you've got a number of these different uh, uh, creatures that are producing this. But it's something that we typically see in selenerates and we don't see it in, uh, it's not the sort of thing that we see in, um, in fish. So it's kind of an unusual, uh, it's kind of an unusual mechanism uh, for producing light in fish. Uh, okay, so these are just a couple of the, um, uh, a couple of the unusual uh, types of uh, bioluminescence that, that actually occur uh, among fish. Uh, kind of fish, it's called the lantern shark. And the lantern shark is unusual because it's actually uh, producing light. Um, normally, the bioluminescence that you see from this from these fish, if they're not if it's not bacterial bioluminescent bioluminescence, that's if it's if it's bioluminescence that's actually being produced by the fish. The way the fish actually controls that is by direct nervous control. That is, it sends an electrical impulse uh, to the light organ, and that causes the light organ to fire. But in the um, in the lantern shark, it's a different mechanism, and it's one of the uh, uh, what's unusual about it. Rather than being under electrical control or nervous system control, it's under uh, hormonal control, and the hormone uh, that's actually uh, controlling this is norepinephrine, and uh, uh, there's another hormone that's involved, which is uh, mel melatonin, and these things are also. Uh, they're also produced in response to uh, different levels of light. So, uh, you know, with low levels of light, you may get more of these things, and you're likely to get more bioluminescence occurring. So, it's kind of another interesting uh, way that you can control these uh, these mechanisms.